Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Disclaimer. This recording is not intended to be utilized as medical advice or a medical diagnosis. If you think you're in need of medical attention or treatment, please seek it immediately. This recording will also contain sensitive subjects such as binging and purging, weight and depression. Please listen at your own discretion and do what you think is best for you. Hey guys, I just wanted to pop in here before the interview. So today's episode is going to be an interview with one of my clients, Jasmine. So happy to have her on. She is unique because she is a coach as well for alcohol recovery. Such an insightful time working with her. So I'm so excited for you guys to hear the gems she has to share with her own recovery with not only working with me and bulimia recovery, but her insights in dealing with alcohol, right? So many things to say. So I'm really excited to share this interview with with you. She has a lot of great um, pieces of wisdom, I think. Very insightful person. But I also wanted to update you guys. I'm still doing the confessionals on my Instagram. It still feels like pulling teeth every time I have to post one. There are some juicy ones coming up and I hate it, but I committed to doing it because I'm impulsive, Um, which is probably why I am where I am today. It's helped me, but it's also sometimes gets me into trouble. But if you want to learn all about my personal life um, or all about my confessions, please go to my Instagram. You'll find it there. And also some exciting news, but kind of sad news is that I am fully booked for coaching until July 2nd. Spots may open up then. So if you've been looking to work with me one-on-one coaching, I can't take on any more clients or I would probably not be a very good coach. So if you would still like to work with me, you can book a consult through um, the link in this podcast or just go to bingebreakers.com and you will find the link to work with me there and you can still book consults to my calendar and that way we can see if we're a good fit if coaching is appropriate for you and then we'll secure coaching spots for July 2nd when they open up. Alternatively, you can always check out my recovery course, which offers group coaching inside the course at a very low cost and affordable alternative to coaching. So you have both those options there. All right, I'll let you guys get to the interview. I hope you enjoy it. And it really is a great interview for inspiration on some experiments you could try in your own bulimia recovery and how she got through it and how she thought it really was going to be so difficult. And actually it wasn't as hard as what she was expecting and the things she learned along the way. So, so excited for you to talk to or listen to this gal. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. And I'm so excited because I have a special guest. It is actually a, she's actually a client of mine and she's a recovery coach herself. And I'm really excited for you to hear her story. For one, I think she has a lot of great advice to share, partly because she is a coach and she has such a reflective, insightful mindset that every time our coaching calls together, we're just always like packed with tons of information and reflection. So I know she has some good gems to share and what her experience was in bulimia recovery and what she's doing now. So um, please welcome Jasmine Murdumbe. She's corrected me on her name several times. I'm trying to pronounce it correctly. Um, So Jasmine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And you're not alone with my pronunciation of my last name. Usually people butcher it before, but it's okay. Yeah. You got it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me. And it's, yeah, it's funny. Um, I don't know. We should all know how to pronounce names more uh, better, but thank you for your patience. But anyway, um, thank you for being on the podcast. And could you just introduce yourself? Like, what do you do? Where are you from? That kind of stuff. Okay. So my name is Jasmine and I am a life and recovery coach and I'm in Toronto, Canada. And I find I found you, Jacqueline, through your podcast. It was uh, I came across it uh, one day in Instagram. I just like hashtagged uh, bulimia, and I found you in the, in your podcast, and I started to follow you from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's always funny. Like people usually find me from the podcast. Clients in particular come from the podcast. But um, tell us, uh, I always ask people, and I'd love for you to share with the audience kind of like what was your life like with bulimia what if you could tell us briefly like what what's your story you know how did bulimia even come into your life okay um I actually started uh my bulimia to actually binge and purge when I was 17 
Mm. I had had conversation with someone and I had been drinking at the time and they, they had shared how people, they throw up after to drink more. Right. Mm. And, and I thought about that. I'm like, why don't I do this with food? Yeah. And I did it both with drinking and then with food. And then I realized, oh my God, I can actually eat what I want and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And I've always had like weight problems. So since I was a kid, I just like grew up just really heavy. We just, I ate all the time. So this was like my solution to, to eating and then just throwing it up because that person had also shared that you won't gain weight. Like you're going to purge out the exact calories that you intake. You're going to throw it up. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh my God, thinks. why isn't everybody doing this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, uh, so I mean, that's, so that's where it started off and it just followed me. I I used it when, especially in the times where I was feeling out of control in my life, um, I can go like weeks or months and not do it. And then all of a sudden it's like, it was almost like I had bottled up all my feelings one by one or just little at a time. And all of a sudden it's like the bulimia came. And it was just mm-hmm. like, then I was, uh, then I was binging for like days, sometimes like hours. And I would like binge and then throw up um, every few hours. So it, even though I didn't experience it where it was every day, it would, it, when I did have it, it was just like every day for like two weeks, but mm-hmm. it would be like two or three times a week, a, a day. Yeah. I hate that in like the, I, maybe they've changed this, but people when you're diagnosing bulimia a lot of them are like well you have to have been consistent with it for a certain amount of time and some people fall out of that criteria because they don't do it daily or like weekly and it's like yeah but if you're maybe going months or or weeks and stuff like that being fine and then suddenly you have like week-long stints of it that's definitely not okay but people see that definition and they're like oh then I'm fine it's not a big deal right Right. And, and, mm-hmm. and that's one of the things that really like, just, I thought, am I bulimic or am I not? Because mm-hmm. I wasn't doing it every day. Right. But what started to happen was it, bulimia for me worked with, for me for a while, because it just put me in this illusion that I was in control mm-hmm. until it stopped working. I say um, where it started to, I can start to, I started to feel the pain of what would happen after I purged, right? right? Like, like I would beat myself up and, and just like, say I'm this horrible person and I can't do anything right. And then the cycle continued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you have like the physical problems with it as well. It's just not, it's very tiring, very energy draining. And did you find, I found this with my case. um, Did you find that even when you weren't binging and purging, you had poor control with food? Oh yes, definitely. Like I, I, I've never had uh, any type of like relationship with food or control until we started working together. Cause I, I was either restricting myself or dieting or binging and purging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wasn't like, there was no medium happy ground. Right. Yeah, um, which yeah. has been one of a lot of our conversations has been about kind of like, it doesn't have to be this all or nothing sort of approach. And I know you know that, but actually saying it out loud, actually talking about it is and the implementing it is hard. Can you also, just so people are aware, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your relationship with alcohol, like alcohol recovery and stuff like that, just so they know? Okay, so I started to drink when I was 14. And um, I mean, I've been eating before I started drinking but for some reason like well I mean I loved both equally but just alcohol was just something that was out there when you're a teenager right so it's like Mm -hmm. it's more socially accepted right even just to to binge drink was just part of the teenage like norm right Mm -hmm. Um, and from there it just uh, yeah I would just drink hardcore 14 till Uh, I went into recovery, which was in my 30s. Um, Alcohol just took me to a dark place of just like uh, insanity thinking. Um, You know, I lost uh, just a lot of my, like just my, I want to say dignity, but just 
just who I was, right? Like I didn't know who I was anymore. And uh, I just kept drinking. I felt like I was going nowhere. And mm -hmm. uh, it got to the point where I thought I was going to lose my kids. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. Um, and I wanted you to share that just because I know a lot of people that are struggling with bulimia have struggled with alcohol and it's mm -hmm. not, sometimes they intermingle, but it's, I just think it's so inspiring that you recover from, from alcohol and things like that. And I know you've, that's kind of what you specialize in, in your own coaching business, right? Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And yeah. I, and I, and what I did learn about uh, my own uh, recovery was I started drinking at 14 and I started to realize along the way that maybe this is not, it's the greatest for me. But when I got to that point, it had become my norm that mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to do, but to drink because it was almost like I was trapped in my own prison. Right. And I'm yeah. like, I want to get out, but I don't know how to. And then mm -hmm. I would look for other people to give me the key to get out. Yes. Yeah. And I followed that. I'm like, I'm just like, I was in my own life going, oh my God, I don't know how to deal with it. So I'm going to drink. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so it took me many years um, to find like my recovery, the recovery that worked for me where I stopped drinking completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I know like this podcast is about bulimia, but I really like, um, well, I'll save it. I'll save it. Cause I know that there's a lot of crossovers between alcohol recovery and bulimia recovery, but in, um, your bulimia recovery or just like mm -hmm. when you were struggling at what point did you know that you needed to get help because you said there was this point where you were like I don't even really need help it's not a problem like when did you decide to reach out for help um like I like it's not like one day for me it happened like where like you get to a point that's the thing about recovery you get to the point where it's like this is the really the darkest that I can go to but I've had so many of them that mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I reached that point of like, okay, I'm gonna get, I've gotten to this dark place and my, my, my binging and purging is so out of control and I need to stop. There was something in my head that was always like, it's okay, this time do it and you're gonna do it differently, right? So then I mm -hmm. would convince myself that binging and purging would work this time. Right. Uh, but I would get to the, yeah, I would get to that point of like, okay, then I would do it again. Right. And then, but I would do it differently. Right. Mm -hmm. And ha what I mean differently, sometimes I would be like, okay, I'm just going to overeat um, on chips. Right. So like, I would just pick certain foods that wouldn't feel so guilty to eat and then purge it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started to control even the way I was binging and purging. And then I would, still feel crappy after right mm -hmm. and then after I would beat myself up and then the cycle again I would say okay I'm going to stop but then it would continue right but each time as I started to get more into like okay this is really out of control it would just get like uh, and it's hard to explain but you get to that point where you're like okay you know what this is really not good for me right mm -hmm. so eventually I had many of those and what started to happen for me was I just realized that like there's a lot of things that are changing in my life as well like my kids are going to go away to to university soon uh, my boyfriend asked me to move in with him like we were planning we're planning on moving in together and what started to happen with me was like oh my god I was thinking first of all like how am I going to move in with him if I have my binging and purging? So do I have to mm -hmm. create this like other person in me, right? Like that person that's jazz who he knows, but then I have to hide myself. So it started to feel like back to my old drinking days of like mm -hmm. being this one person in front of one person and then being another person in another. And I had many like identities that way. So mm -hmm. I started to feel like that. And then I got to that point where I was just like, okay, this, this is really causing me a lot of pain. And I really had to look at that. Just that pain had hit me hard. And knowing that my kids were going to be gone, I thought I could get away with this. So again, mm -hmm. it went back to how I was when I was drinking. I'm getting away with it. I'm creating these personalities. And I was just like, you know what? I can't do this with food. Right. Yeah. I think that's, oh, that's huge because a lot of people 
start changing when they start to realize this isn't going to work in my life unless I do these things. And you start to notice, and you, thankfully, you had the experience with alcohol, so you could probably Mm. see some parallels, right? Like you described, and it's like, in order to keep bulimia in my life, I have to be two different people. It's it's really hard to do that in moderation. And it's really hard to be two different personalities. You often just become your dominant personality. Um, So that's, that's really good insight for sure. Yeah. So when you decided to get help, I want to ask like, what, what did you expect from recovery? First of all, before even like talking to me, like, what did you expect you had to do to recover? I was honestly thinking, oh my God, I have to go and admit to somebody that I'm binging and purging. That was (laughs) like the first thing, like the scary thing is like, now I'm going to have to admit to somebody else that I'm doing it. Cause I have other people that like, that I've spoken to and they've been um, like, I have a couple of people that I share and they've been extremely supportive, but there's always that shame that I'm doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then going to a new, a new person, like a coach to say it, it's like, Oh my God, I have to admit that I've done it. Right. And Mm -hmm. that was for me terrifying. And I heard your podcast and I can't remember what the podcast was called, but it was, you said, um, if you've purged, binged and purged, um, just remember you didn't kick a puppy right (laughs) yeah Uh and I like laughed out loud right because I was like oh my god it's true like I when I every time I binged and purged I just a beat myself up but I acted like I was like this like mean person to everybody else Mm -hmm. like it was just like this I'm this horrible person like how am I going to pick up my life you know now that I just binged and purged (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And when you said that, it was like, I just laughed because it, first of all, it just, it broke me out of that, that thought of like, I'm this worst person. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's true. I didn't kick up puppy. Like, you know, it's, it really brought me down to reality of like, I hurt myself. And now what I'm going to, what am I going to do about this? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a really good way to phrase it. It's like, I hurt myself like this, what, what I just did wasn't the best and looking at it with a constructive criticism instead of a, um, a not helpful, putting yourself down, demeaning sort of criticism. Like there's two different ways to do it. Um, and it's almost like you have to treat yourself as if you would other people like it, like office, um, what is like office culture or whatever? Like you wouldn't go into work and be like, hey, you're a terrible person because you didn't get this report done. You'd be like, Timothy, why is this report not done? Let's talk about it, right? <laughs> It'd be much yeah. more cordial. Um, yeah. But we treat ourselves pretty horribly. So yeah, and I think what you brought up, like having to tell someone is such a big issue. And I think that's um, maybe why people feel comfortable with me because I've been there before too. It's not like I'm a novice to it, but we think that it's such a shameful act and it's really not, it's a, it's a big deal in some ways. Sure. I don't want to say that, but it's not Mm -hmm. a huge deal. It's not like you're the most terrible person on earth because of it. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was like the worst thing that you were expecting from recovery. Was that it? Or was there anything else like absurd that you thought you would have to do? Um, no, I, I mean, I think, um, not knowing how to go in there, but I, I also went in with the, and I don't know if this will answer the question, but I also went in with doubt that I could recover. Um, so that was my biggest thing because, um, like I shared earlier, food had just always been like, I I would say like my best friend, right. But it's like Mm -hmm. my friend of me, right. Cause it just, it was always there for me to comfort me at such a young age. And then I let go of food, went to alcohol, and then um, I still maintained that relationship with food, but it was just more like just the alcohol took me to a better place for me, a better euphoria, right? And uh, mm-hmm. so it was, you know, I, I went in there um, like just not knowing if, um, if I could recover from it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, um, what helped you with that? Because that's a huge thing. Uh, and that's why I try to be so inspiring in my podcast because people really don't believe that they can recover. They think that you can do it. Everyone else, people are listening. They're like, yeah, well, she's special. She was able to recover, uh, but it's a lost cause for me. So what helped you kind of build that belief in yourself? And I had the same. I I felt like 
like I'm not um, strong enough. I'm not that special enough to recover from it. It feels like a big job, right? It, and, mm-hmm. it, and it's what I thought in my head. But as we started to coach, and we had one one coaching episode, I remember where you told me that because uh, we were talking about uh, making choices and making that decision. And when when I was um, in my the most uncomfortableness, I remember feeling like just really uncomfortable about overeating, right? And mm-hmm. that's what triggered me to to uh, go into binging and then purging. And I remember talking to you about my drama, the drama in my head, right? Mm-hmm. And just like, you know, I said, I, want, I wasn't gonna purge, but then after, you know, I, I, I went back and forth with it and, and, you know, I explained it to you and you said, then we started talking about making a decision. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you said, you know, once you decide not to do it, then, you know, it's, it, it gets a lot easier. So ah. what I took from that was, oh my God, I need to make a decision. Like I've been just bouncing off, fooling around with the idea of like recovering, not recovering. So it makes sense that now that I'm deciding if I decide not to binge and purge that I could do it. And it just made sense that I could control it because I didn't think I can control bulimia. It was something that I thought I was like born with it or I had developed it and I had no control over it. And now it's just kind of like putting a bandaid over a cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I remember you, us talking about this thing that you had in it had been like a week or two since we started coaching, I think, and you had this moment in a grocery store, right? And you've been doing really yeah. well and you were just like panicking a lot. And I remember you telling me, I remember saying to myself, this is temporary. And I think you said like, I just have to decide. And then it, it did, it was uncomfortable. It wasn't like super easy, but it passed. And what you're saying, like people don't understand, they try to complicate decision-making. They're like, well, how do you actually make a decision? And this is the most frustrating thing for someone to hear out there right now, but it's like, no, you just have to decide to not do something. And I think the, the when you know that you have decided on something is you'll feel some sort of different emotion than what you're previously feeling. Because the drama you're referring to feels confusing. It feels anxious the decision can sometimes feel frustrating and annoying but then you move past it right yeah and and Mm -hmm. and it's and also too like once I made that decision I felt empowered like I felt like oh my god I can do this and you know I didn't go into I can do this for a few weeks I can do this for the next years you know of my life I just went into I can do this each time I feel this way And that was huge for me because I think sometimes in my head in in recovery, it's like I go into panic mode, like, oh, my God, what am I going to do without bulimia? Like, who am I going to be? And then it's that drama that sets in. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was like, no, I'm going to use this tool for each time I feel this way and just remind myself that I did have that tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you really embraced it and did get very empowered with your decisions. Um, I remember you telling me, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but we, again, I think it had been like a week or two in a coaching, you were like, this kind of feels like it's a little too easy. Like it shouldn't be happening this way. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is why I asked like what you had expected recovery to be. So was that the biggest su- surprise was that you had control? Um, I think, yes, I, that was like the biggest aha moment for me is that I could make that decision. Um, because I had just lived all like my life, just thinking like I had no control over this. I'm this bad person. Cause I have no control over it. Everybody mm-hmm. else has it figured out. So when <laughs> I had, and then, you know, listen to other people that recovered. It was just like, oh my God, how, how did they do it? And I can, again, it went back to that. So when I had realized I had made the decision, it wasn't just about that, like the, like how I was feeling each time. It was about so many lies that I had been telling myself in the past about 
um, my relationship with food, binging and purging, it almost like it just all made sense. It was like that puzzle that was like, oh my God, I am not damaged or I am not this horrible person that I think I am because I have bulimia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that I am not damaged, right? We think that we're such like broken goods or something and it's it's not true. I mean, like all of us have... <laughs> all of us have weird things going on. Like all of us are like a little bit strange, yes. but it doesn't mean that you're incapable of doing a lot of the things that you want to do. So that's, that's amazing. So with food, but like you, with the binging and purging and going through an urge, can you tell us a little bit like what that was like for you? Like how difficult was it the first time you experienced an urge and like pausing and everything like that? Okay, I remember I was actually at uh, the restaurant I work at, and mm -hmm. I was just feeling, because, you know, working in a restaurant, it can be really stressful for anybody that works, and mm -hmm. the food is so good, so it's like, oh my god, I want to eat this all the time, right? <laughs> so, right, I was going to say, like, if you guys think that Jasmine had it easy, you know, she's been working at a restaurant with, like, delicious food everywhere <laughs> for the whole time, so... <laughs> definitely like on a, a difficult, having a difficult time, right? Yes. And it was so stressful. And I think me and uh, my mom had gotten into a fight and, and the food was there. And there, and you know, there was like, there was foods that I considered bad, right? And it was like, um, like greasy, uh, like pork rinds, right? And they're so delicious. But in the past, before like we started working together it would be my go-to and it was almost like I wasn't even thinking it was like I just grabbed it put it in my mouth I felt I tasted it and then it's like oh my god I just ate like a handful and then I would just keep eating it even though I said I ate a handful and then all of a sudden it's like oh my god I need to purge mm. right yeah and then it, depending on the time it happened I would Per, uh, binge the whole rest of the the shift until I got home to purge it right mm -hmm. so it was so uncomfortable like because sometimes it would be like I would start like five hours before my shift ended so oh, it would wow. be five hours of just binging mm -hmm. you know and it's you know and we all know it it's so it's a torturous like physically and mentally right mm -hmm. um so when I first so that was how it was before and then um my first time it was we had worked together and and we talked about feeling uncomfortable and just like just letting those emotions settle in right into myself and I and I was I remember being in the counter and it, I was just felt so many emotions I was so angry and I was upset just to, just because it was stressful and then I was like okay this feels so uncomfortable and I I just <laughs> I wanted to grab those pork rinds and I'm like no, nope, you're not grabbing the pork rinds. You're going to just sit through this emotion. So I made that decision to sit through it. And it was hard. Like it, it, mm -hmm. it lasted like, it felt like an hour, but it was probably like five minutes. I, I remember, I think you yeah. asked me and I'm like, I don't know, but <laughs> it, 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 it felt long and it feels like there's a freight train coming. It's like, cause it's like all these emotions, just like, I want to eat. There's that battle. I want to eat, you know? you know, there's the drama inside. And I just, I stood there. And then I would then I, I, I went from feeling and then I was like, I'm gonna be okay. Like, I'm not gonna binge and I'm not gonna purge this, but I'm not gonna binge this right now. Because all I needed to worry was that I wasn't gonna binge. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the binging is what sets off the purging for me. Right? So, yeah. mm -hmm. so I was like, just for t just for right now, just don't eat anything right and mm -hmm. so that's that was like the pause method that um i had started to um to use yeah thank you for sharing that yeah because it's like it is super uncomfortable it's helped people all the time like you just have to feel uncomfortable and it's not super fun it's not a great time but once you go through it and once you actually allow it to pass it's kind of like oh this wasn't that bad it feels terrible but then afterwards you start that starts to give you like momentum too you start having little wins and building that momentum to where you are now yes I mean after after that had happened that also sets that you know that 
the path to like, oh my God, I did this. And this was like so hard because, you know, if when you're fighting with people that you love that are closest to you, that feels like the hardest as opposed mm -hmm. to like strangers. Sometimes with strangers, you don't care as much, but it's people in, in your circle. It's like, I can go into again, the drama of like, oh my God, is that person going to talk to me? I just told them off or like, you know, it's mm -hmm. just like, these things that go through your head that makes it more intense. But uh, after I had lived through it, I was like, oh my God, I lived through this and it was right. okay. Yeah. 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 Well, and you start to find a lot of people think like the binging and purging is just a habit that they don't, they're not really attached to it. But after you start to like stop doing it, you realize like there's this whole emotional life that you're just kind of avoiding with the binging. And then you have to clean up that, which isn't, which isn't always fun, but it puts you in a better place long-term. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me, I think that gives a good insight of like the binging and purging, but then we we talked to a lot of our coaching was spent on like food relationship and eating things in moderation. Right. And can you tell me about like how it was for you to have a balance with food in your life? Yeah. How do you do that now? So one of the things that I'm, I'm doing is I'm allowing myself to, to eat um, what I want at that time and during the day. Um, but also to knowing that I don't have to eat that empanada or that cupcake. Um, I choose to eat it today right mm -hmm. and um that also took a lot of work of like giving myself permission to like if I did eat it it didn't mean that I was going to gain weight right because mm -hmm. in my mind um I always thought if I eat and I remember we had the session of like if I eat um the empanada I'm going to gain weight and just getting past that like getting past the fact that I'm not going to gain weight if I eat that empanada, but also mm -hmm. if I did gain weight, that was okay too, because it's part of the process in getting uh, in recovery, right? Because I had allowed myself to be in like the restrictive diet, the dieting, and then binging and purging. My body was just so out of whack. It didn't know what it was doing. And if this meant if gaining weight was part of the recovery, then that had to be something I had to just throw out the idea of like, it like, it's bad if I do gain weight, right? Because I had right. to, I really believe that, oh my God, I'm going to gain weight um, if I'm eating what I want it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Gaining weight, I know it's something that's such a huge fear for everyone. And I always say like, like right now you're working on your own like sustainable long-term weight loss journey but you can choose to lose weight later if you want to but the weight gain and recovery is totally worth it for your just your sanity your mental space not being in that loop and it's so hard for people to believe that and I was really against that back in the day too it was like no way like that's not worth it at all but it is just to regain the level-headedness that you have now in recovery is so so worth it and it's like everyone listening they definitely need to hear that but um yeah food for you you mentioned something interesting was like allowing yourself to eat what you want and we had a lot of discussions about owning your food choices right yeah and like it was interesting because we well first of all let's talk about um actually I want to ask you because what was it it was a cupcake I think that I had you like eat on purpose and I, you because yes. you were like kind of scared we were talking it happens in recovery you're like scared to eat trigger foods and so I you scheduled eating up cupcake and you were expecting it to be this like really fun experience but it actually wasn't can you tell us about that a little bit yeah so it was, it was called the cupcake I think experiment <laughs> um, <laughs> because what had happened was our family was having a like an online zoom birthday party and uh my sister had given us cupcakes to like for every household and uh, I saw everybody eating cupcakes and I, and, you know, I had that, like, I don't want a cupcake. Um, but I also felt like I wasn't part of it. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah, my homework was to make time to eat the cupcake and to journal while I was eating it. 
right? Yeah, what everyone wants to do. So, so I, so I, I, you know, I told my kids the plan because they're they were they're aware of like just I'm in recovery as well. So, um, I'm like I'm gonna eat a cupcake and uh, this is what it is. And I was like telling them about it, and I was actually excited because um, it was the first time that I was like looking at like a cupcake as just eating a cupcake so that was like okay like because you know there's there's something about like in 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 our society or in families where you know you eat certain foods and it's like supposed to like be the greatest thing you know what I mean it's like um, Mm -hmm. you know we're all built around eating food and you know it's like this great thing and so when I was going to eat the the cupcake I was like I'm just, I'm going to eat a cupcake, right? So that kind mm-hmm. of, that started to lessen the the facade of it, right? And the romantic, or I don't know what it's called, like the, um, I'll say facade. And so I sat down and I took a picture of the cupcake. I wrote on my journal how I felt about eating it. And I took a couple bites and I just really tasted the actual cupcake, right? Mm-hmm. With each bite, and it was so different than just being at a party or just saying, I'm going to have a cupcake. You know, it, it felt really different, like from the cupcake. I mean, previously I would get like this high of like, oh my God, I'm eating this. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I would just swallow it up. Right. But this was actually just sitting down and just really tasting it. And just, it didn't give me that high. It was just mm. the strangest thing. It was just like, I'm eating a cupcake, right? And it, and also <laughs> it, it took away that, you know, that the whole celebration of eating it. And then Absolutely. I journaled it. Yeah. And then I just made that decision um, was part of the homework, like decide if I want to eat the rest of the cupcake or not. Mm-hmm. And then I just, I gave it to my kids. Oh, that's so cool. I know people listening are going to be like, what? You know, because you just, <laughs> but eating a cupcake and like a very fast setting when you're talking with people or alone and like wolfing it down it's a very different experience than like sitting down journaling then taking a bite writing about it taking a bite it's like the most laborious intensive experience and it really like the point of it was for you to be like a cupcake can be fun but a cupcake can also be really boring and I think that was so cool for you to see at that moment because you're like oh food can be very different depending on your thoughts about it right yes yeah, it's ah, so, so true. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also that reminds me, you mentioned something um, that your kids knew you were in recovery. Mm-hmm. And how was that experience like telling them that you were in recovery? Um, I had told them um, previously about having bulimia. And so they already knew that I had been struggling with it. Um, I have, um, it was hard. It wasn't easy to, to share it um, because just like there's something, there's shame around it. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's very different than being an alcoholic. Um, mm-hmm. There's something just different about having bulimia versus having alcoholism. Um, that's what I found. But going through this journey, I realized it's not any different. Like I'm still like, the same person um and now i'm recovering from bulimia and uh, alcoholism so it wasn't easy but it was something that because i was in a lot of pain it was Mm -hmm. okay you know this is what i'm going through um and they and i and i wanted them i wanted them to know also because they might have their struggles one day with it right and you know, it's important that I say to them, this is what I'm dealing with. And there is recovery. Right. That's so inspiring. And I I asked you because I know there's a lot of parents out there that there are parents that I talk to parents listen, Mm -hmm. and they feel such shame and fear for their kids that they're going to damage them in some way or that they're going to find out and that they're horrible parents because of it. And that is so beside the case. And I know people listening right now, you don't know Jasmine like I do, but like she loves her kids so dearly and they seem to have really good relationships. But um, it's so cool that you were able to tell them and be honest and open about it. And it didn't just like ruin their lives. It didn't 
damage them severely or anything. And it actually sounds like it made you guys have a really more honest relationship when it came to that. Yeah. And that's the thing, the powerful thing about um, recovery is that, you know, and I, I started drinking at 14. I had my daughter at 16. So I pretty much drank all of her life until she was 18. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I thought, you know, I'm like the worst mother, you know, I, I went through all that, like this horrible person. But what I realized in recovery is that I gave, by me recovering, I'm giving them a window to, for them to be human and to say, Mm -hmm. you know what, I might one day be struggling as well. And my mom found recovery, right? So that means I have a chance at recovery and I needed to look at that. I mean, I felt it, but also too, is like, it was something that in my own recovery for both, it's like, give them that hope that Mm -hmm. it can happen for them. And it's, and I, I mean, I have conversations with them and they tell me they're like even advocates about like just alcoholics, right? They're just like, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, (laughs) you know, they have my recovery and they'll tell their, their friends about it. So it's, it's beautiful because it is a family, it's a family thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, For both alcoholism and bulimia, it affects like the whole family and that's one of the things I also learned in recovery. It's, I thought it was just hurting myself, but it's actually the whole family that gets impacted by it. Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, you don't know it, it might not be severe, but just your presence, once you like go through, if you're in bulimia, you're usually a different person. And once you're outside of bulimia, you're a different person. And those, that personality affects other people, even if there's like nothing else going on. And there's so many things that we could talk about, but like, how do you feel after? Like, how do you feel right now compared to who you were when you were in bulimia? What has changed? Oh, I feel, I feel like a totally different person. I feel (laughs) um, just being around food. Like Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel scared of food. I don't feel, um, especially my trigger foods. I feel like, um, like going in, especially um, after we, like we ended the sessions, it was, I feel empowered to move on with like having my own like eating plan and what's going to work, what's not right. Like what is, I feel very hopeful about that. Like I don't need to fall back into bulimia. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and if I do, that's also okay because I'm not, I won't be kicking a puppy. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, there's tools that that I have that I don't have to go back into that darkness. Absolutely. I think mm-hmm. uh, that's a big thing that we talk about. And I'm, I think we had this conversation as well is that, you know, if you were to binge and purge tomorrow, what would you do? And that's something mm-hmm. I ask a lot of people, because once they have this success under their belt, they're then so scared to go back. They're like, what if I, what if I trip up? What if I go back? And it's like, okay, let's go there. What if you go back into bulimia? what are you going to do? And it, I think if you were to binge and perch tomorrow, you would have a very different approach to it. You would definitely have more awareness to it and you would probably be able to get yourself back up out of it rather quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also too, I know that I have a support group like in in our community, the Facebook community, right? There's so much support there. Everybody's just loving and supporting with each other. And I just you know, I saw some women post and I thought, you know, I'm going to get in on it too, right? Like I mm-hmm. belong to this community, so I'm going to do it too. So, and I love that because everybody's just trying to help each other. Yeah. And like you said, peer support is so important. Um, you mentioned that to me once and it was so vital for you in alcohol recovery. And then it's really vital in bulimia recovery. And once you're willing to kind of like lift that veil and talk to the people, you'd be surprised like how much you can find out and everyone has their own like individual spin on the advice and some things work for other people some things don't so I love seeing a community and like some people will give advice and I'm like oh yeah it's a really good idea like I didn't even think about that it's awesome uh, yeah <laughs> yeah well that's fantastic to hear I think um I might ask you let me see my questions I was like a list of questions and then I'm like uh-huh. overwhelmed and I'm like oh my god what do I say <laughs> um so I love to ask people especially clients that I've worked with if someone out there is struggling with bulimia right maybe they're in the position you were what would be some advice you would give to them um 
I would say, um, don't give up on yourself. You're not a lost cause. Um, I thought that as well, you know, like I couldn't do it. Like here's Jacqueline, like she could do it. You know, there's other people on, in like social media and, you know, just hearing your truth and hearing your story about how you recovered really helped me. So we're not lost causes. That's, mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Like we can recover, like, you know, just letting go of the idea, like I can't do this because of whatever reasons it is uh, it's only helps to stop us from recovery mm -hmm. right and just opening up like our minds to saying but what if I could recover yeah yeah I was gonna add, say add to that and be like instead of arguing for why you can't argue for why you could right why you can yeah like stop you're wasting time being like this is another reason why I can't another reason why I can't it's like have you ever spent any time thinking about why you could why it is possible um and start arguing for that belief it's so much more useful so I love that you said that yeah, yeah. we're certainly not lost causes that's for sure and it that's why we do what we do and that's why you're um in the industry you're in as well because you have been there and you want to help other people so I'd love to like ask you what you're doing with your life now and your business as a recovery coach as well. What's going on for you? So um, I'm very excited. Like after um, even so before I started working with you, I felt this block of um, how am I going to help other people, you know, with their alcoholism. I did feel even as a coach, like, oh, my God, I'm going to go to another coach and tell her this. And, you know, but I, I knew that I needed to put myself out there, be vulnerable about this, like about this stage in my life before I open up my business in life coaching. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for that. Cause you really helped me to take that block out. Right. Oh, and yeah. um, just like now, so now what I'm doing is I'm working on um, my business for life and as a life and recovery coach from alcoholism. And I, I created a plan, it's called the drinking safety plan. So what it is, is it's a journal that has like questions for, um, for the women that, um, that wants to stop drinking. And as you know, in recovery, it's not, it's not as easy as like, I'm going to stop drinking, right? It's like, there's mm -hmm. so much in between. There's so many questions that we, we need to ask ourselves. And it's, an ongoing uh, process for some people like some people will will get it right away some people don't and you know my part of the, my journey was it took me years to stop drinking you know mm -hmm. and in one of my darkest moments I would write in my journal of like why can't I just stop and in my journal I was drunk because like the writing was just like you could tell I was drunk and I was just in so much pain but it just for some reason, when I had written in it, it for I when I went to look reflect back, it was it was my call out for help, right? Mm -hmm. And somewhere inside of me was just like, you need help when I was drinking, and so that prompted me for myself. I'm like, I'm gonna create this journal that um, if someone's drinking, they can reflect back on their um, their triggers, their like their their cravings, uh, what happened before. So it's like a pre-drinking episode, what happened during, uh, what happens after, and then they can reflect back on it. And then I'm going to also add in like a coaching package so we can just reflect on it together just to give them the chance to reflect back instead of beating yourself up because mm -hmm. that's like where I went. I just bet myself up and repeated the pattern right yeah. and this Those is moments like moments are golden opportunities to learn yes and you know just me and the woman working together to see it as yeah as a tool to your recovery and like what sets you off what what is it that made you feel inside that you needed to pick up that drink and why do you pick up the drink how do you feel when you do it and just those reflections to help her move towards her recovery of what her goal is for like to stop drinking or you know maybe just drinking once in a while like whatever her goal is 
Mm -hmm. That sounds really handy for recovery. And I'm sure, again, I've never necessarily struggled with alcohol, but I can't imagine how vital that would be to someone who's struggling with alcohol. And again, like to work with someone like support from someone who's been there, um, like you, I'm sure would just get, bring someone so much comfort to go through the journey and like, no, you're not alone. It's someone who gets it, someone who struggled for a long time. So um, yeah, anyone out there that is struggling with alcohol and they really aren't sure where to go to, please reach out to Jasmine. You're on Instagram, right? What's your um, Instagram coaching profile? So my coaching profile is life and recovery coach. Mm -hmm. it's just all one word all right well yeah I'm sure people can find you there and yeah something interesting you said too is like you felt bad talking to me about the fact that you're going through bulimia recovery as a coach like to another coach but like everybody needs to work on something I need to work on tons of stuff so like I always I don't um people out there think that oh like once you get coaching you'll be perfect or something then that's not true and coaches and coaching like everyone needs and if you can't afford a coach, like just get someone to talk to, work on your stuff on your own for sure. Like it's, it makes you stronger too. Like your struggle with bulimia made you stronger and it's going to be able, you're going to be able to help so many people who are probably struggling with alcohol and bulimia at the same time. Cause that's just, it's so common. So it's really vital, I think, to a lot of people. It's a strong trait, but okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you for being on the show, Jasmine. I appreciate all your insight. I just want to say thank you for having me on and uh, you've been just amazing uh, coach to work with. You've taught me a lot. I just with myself, bulimia and other things because, you know, going in, I thought this is about bulimia and my food, but it's also about other areas in my life that I've been able to like remove blocks to move forward. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate I always say this, but like, thank you for trusting me to work with you. It's always a leap of faith with people, and um, I have learned so much from you too. Don't even, don't even worry about that. Like, it's, it's people don't understand how amazing it is to work with someone struggling because you learn a lot, right? It's a learning process for everyone. But um, I know we're running out of time, so thank you so much. All right, bye, guys. Hey, if you like this episode, you have to come check out the Binge Breakers Recovery course. If you're trying to recover from bulimia and you're sick of doing it alone and you feel like you've tried a lot of traditional therapies and it's not working with you, come join the course. Go to bingebreakers.com slash recovery dash course.